Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Let me begin with this slide or these data which I ran across some years ago looking at the age when Nobel Prize laureates in medicine or physiology did the work that led to their Nobel Prize. And it's a fairly depressing slide for more senior people like myself suggesting that um, most Nobel laureates in medicine did their work uh, fairly early on suggesting that maybe as we get older we're not quite as productive as perhaps we were when we were younger. Now recently, uh, Stanford had its own Nobel laureate. This is Andrew Fire, who did work looking at RNA interference. And the age at which he published his key paper is right there uh, in the middle. So he falls right where he should be in terms of when he did his most productive work. And Stanford was very fortunate to have the second Nobel laureate uh, announced this year, although not in medicine or physiology. This is in chemistry, Roger Kornberg, whose key papers were published a little bit later looking at um, um, RNA polymerase, although this is a horribly difficult uh, undertaking. I understand that he began his research two decades before, so he actually was not a slow learner. He's actually just someone that worked very hard in a very hard project and sort of also fell into this, uh, this category where uh, sometimes peak productivity is thought to occur a little bit earlier on in life. Now these are some fairly depressing data on this slide. Um, looking at the ability to remember a word list, these are some data we collected, cross-sectional data in a rural part of Arkansas, Bradley County, looking at how many words people remembered during the telephone interview. And um, what is plotted there for each individual dot are average scores at individual ages, you know, 40, 41, so forth, going on up to uh, late 90s and it looks like a fairly steep drop-off in terms of the amount of information learned on average as a function of age and these are people who aren't uh, are thought not to be demented although they weren't specifically screened for that. Another study looking at similar kinds of information um, this is um, these are data taken from the Wexler memory scale a standardized test looking at memory studies and a different kind of memory task this is a paragraph learning task where people are given a short story, paragraph length, and asked immediately to recall as much information, and then roughly a half an hour later to recall as much information as possible. And what's plotted here are scores, essentially average scores, um, by different age groupings here. And again, you can see that over time there's a drop off, and by the time someone is in their 80s, they're following the standard in deviation or and a half or maybe even two standard deviations below what someone um, five or six decades before would have done. But in fact, the cross-sectional kinds of data that were shown in the last two slides are a bit misleading because when one looks at cognitive functions longitudinally, there are declines, but they aren't nearly as steep as the data in the last two slides would have uh, suggested where you're looking at people who are quite older, whose educational levels were different, whose life experiences were different, and so it gives a misleading uh, picture about how large or how steep the declines are, although in fact there are some declines. Um, these are uh, data that come from a study uh, undertaken in East Boston looking at older people who are tested at two points in time. And what is shown here are uh, scores, a global cognitive measure shown here, the dotted line represents average scores. And some of the people at the time of second follow-up uh, ended up with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, most of the people didn't. And if you look at the people that here in the left-hand portion of the slide uh, who ended up with an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis at the second time point, you can see that they sort of started off by and large below the average point shown here by the dotted line. And if you look at the slope of the lines, it's sort of a decline. And so these are people that obviously that weren't doing as well. But if you look at older people who were in the same study who didn't end up with an Alzheimer's diagnosis several years down the line, 
you can see they started off on average better. And looking at these individual um, uh, trajectories up here, you can see that a lot of them are fairly flat. So in fact, some of the cross-sectional data that we are looking at before was quite misleading. Nevertheless, that for a lot of cognitive abilities, there are changes that occur during middle age and during aging. Um, the rate of change differs depending on cognitive skills, and the kind of memory tasks that were shown in the first two slides are, um, do represent uh, functions that do change as a function of aging. There's been a concept that's been developed recently referred to as mild cognitive impairment. The term means just what you think it would mean. It's particularly related to memory, so the amnestic variety of mild cognitive impairment. And it's sometimes defined as people that have some memory problems, although they perform pretty well in activities of daily living. Um, cognitive functions otherwise are pretty good. Memory is abnormal for age, and the example they give here is one and a half standard deviations below norms for that paragraph uh, recall task, and the cognitive impairments aren't severe enough to represent dementia. And the term dementia itself is just an umbrella term for cognitive impairment that interferes substantially with one's ability to conduct daily affairs. And the significance is that, at least in some studies, older people who end up with the diagnosis of this variety of mild cognitive impairment are at higher risk for having an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis some years later. These are data from Peterson and colleagues of the Mayo Clinic uh, looking at um, mild cognitive impairment followed up for a period of years. And after about five years in this particular study, um, almost half the people are converted to an Alzheimer's disease diagnosis. So it's thought that um, trouble with this particular kind of memory, episodic memory, is um, sort of a risk factor, an early indication that maybe something isn't exactly right. So we've already talked a bit about uh, cognitive aging and memory. and. We'll go next to speak a little bit about menopause and hormone therapy there and the uh, data that are available pertaining to hormone therapy and cognition and uh, particularly memory. And we'll move from there from hormone therapy and Alzheimer's disease and a few other miscellaneous topics toward the end. So that's, that's where we're going next. So a bit on terminology, hormone therapy, at least the way I'm using it, refers to estrogen either estrogen given by itself or given with another hormone, uh, progesterone. Um, both of these hormones are produced naturally um, by the ovaries. Um, although we're not getting into this much during this presentation, there are different kinds of estrogens like 17-beta estradiol or estrone or conjugated equine estrogens. And it's also apparent that estrogens and progestins can be administered through different routes. For example, um, hormone therapy be Hormone therapy can be given orally. Some forms can be given through the skin transdermally, and there are different biological effects depending on how it's given. Doses can differ whether the combinations are given altogether or um, sequentially also makes some difference. And in general, the term hormone therapy encompasses all of this, and sometimes that's confusing to people. And in most cases, the differences haven't been separated out, and I'll just be using the term hormone therapy sort of in this broad context during the rest of this talk. So standard definition, menopause is a permanent loss or the permanent cessation of menstruation that results from loss of ovarian follicular function. The ovary follicles, of course, are, um, is a place where um, estrogen is made primarily, progesterone, and menstruation is defined as an event, and that's the final menstrual period. It's not really a prolonged period of time, although that's the way the term is used in, in the common literature. So this is the definition of, um, of menopause. And here in this slide, the year zero refers to the final menstrual period. Um, these dots represent individual levels of estradiol. These are mean values shown here in the red line. And what you can see is beginning several years before the, t the final menstrual period. And by the way, this is on average about age 51. Um, you can see that estradiol levels start to decline, and the decline continues actual several years on average after the final menstrual period. So the menopausal transition um, or perimenopause sort of encompasses in general this period of time with the declining levels of estradiol. And so although menopause and the medical nomenclature represent a particular point in time, in fact, this is a physiological process that occurs a bit more gradually than the term itself would appear to imply. Most other tissues in the body are responsive to different hormones, including estrogen, and particularly including the brain, which is my favorite organ. Um, this is a rat brain. We know people and rats have a lot in common, particularly in academic centers. And this. 
This is work by Paul Chagru showing the distribution of the two different types of estrogen receptors within the rat brain. And there's good reason to think that other mammals would have similar kinds of distribution. Um, the two receptor types are referred to alpha and beta. And you can see that um, looking, they're shown differently in the different colors. This is hippocampus, for example, the part of the brain that's most particularly concerned with episodic memory. You can see that the two estrogen receptors are differentially distributed. Uh, more of the beta receptor, for example, in hippocampus compared to the alpha receptor. This is cortex here. And the point is that the brain does have receptors for estrogen. The two, estro the two receptor types are differentially distributed. And one might see here that there, at least theoretically, there is a mechanism by which estrogen can have differential effects in brain function and effects in functions, on functions in parts of the brain that are known to subserve reproductive functions. Um, most of estrogen effects probably are mediated through um, effects directly on the genome. Um, this is the way the other steroid hormones also have their effects, but there are also some effects that appear to be receptor mediated but not really dependent on interaction with the gene. Some of these are rapid actions, estrogen effects on neurotransmitter uh, release, for example, or, or ionic permeability. And there are some effects of estrogen that probably don't require interaction with specific uh, uh, receptors. These are um, interactions. Some of the antioxidant effects, for example, appear not to be receptor mediated. There are also ways that estrogen can affect the brain and nerve cells indirectly. Estrogen clearly has effects on the supportive cells of the nervous system, glial cells. There are effects on the immune uh, system, and their immune response is known to be very important in several different neurological diseases, including, we think, Alzheimer's disease. There are various effects that estrogen would have on blood flow. Blood goes, goes to the brain as well as other organs, of course. Um, but effects on the endothelium, the lining of the blood vessels, on clotting, on the buildup of um, atherosclerosis within the arteries. There are a number of different effects in laboratory animals and humans that estrogen would have. And these might indirectly be thought to affect brain. And finally, effects on the active transport of uh, glucose uh, and energy substrate into the brain and, and brain metabolism. So a lot of ways, at least theoretically, that estrogen could have an effect on brain function and some of these ways one would think would be relevant to um, disorders like cognitive aging, like Alzheimer's disease. One would think. This is an older slide. I'd, I'd like to show it. Uh, this is from Dominique Tournalloran's laboratory at Columbia University, one of the first workers um, interested in this aspect of estrogen effect. Um, and what is shown here are explants from fetal rat brains in uh, a tissue culture dish. And the explants themselves would be sort of down here below what's shown in the slide. And these are nerve processes growing out from the explants. And you can see here in the untreated media that there is a, a certain amount of, of outgrowth of these nerve fibers. And when there's more estradiol, a particular form of estrogen within the media, then the outgrowth is more exuberant. So this is just one way of demonstrating, at least in a laboratory model at certain gestational age, that estrogen can have clear effects on, this, uh, on the growth of nerve processes within portions of the brain. This is from the Seattle Midlife Women's Health Study, um, asking women whether or not they noticed changes in memory in the past few years. And not surprisingly, the majority, 62% in this study, responded yes. But there aren't a lot of objective data, or at least there weren't until the past several years, looking at memory in terms of actual measurements. Um, one of the projects that I was involved in is something referred to as a Melbourne Women's Midlife Health Project a cohort, a fairly modest size by any contemporary standards, but at the time fairly large, 300 uh, and something women who were um, recruited by uh, Lorraine Dinnerstein in Melbourne to look at a number of different functions as women went through uh, the midlife transition through menopause. Um, at the time of initial recruitment, they were 45 to 55 years of age, still menstruating, not in hormone therapy. 326 women participated in um, different kinds of cognitive testing funded through the Alzheimer's Association. And the data I'm going to show here is based on an episodic memory task, and that is the ability to learn and remember a 10-item word list. So the participants were given a list of words and then asked to re remember them, three immediate recall trials, and then one delayed recall trial somewhat later. 
and breaking down women to where they were in terms of reproductive stage. There were 50 women who were still menstruating in the menopausal transition, another 150 or so who were in the early postmenopause, and this is defined by being within five years of the final menstrual period. And although this is still a, a middle age group and not an older group, um, about 50 women were just beyond that five year period. And what one might expect is if the loss of ovarian function had a large impact on episodic memory, it would show up in uh, learning of this wordless task, and in fact, we didn't see any differences. You can see here for the immediate recall, these bars are higher because they represent three trials, no difference based on reproductive stage, and the same is true here for delayed recall. This is a slide looking at circulating levels of the hormone estradiol in the same group. This is a Melbourne group again. The memory score is shown here along this axis. Along this axis is shown the concentration of estrogen. The immediate recall scores are plotted in blue up above, and the delayed recall scores there down below. And essentially, you can see, regardless of concentration, it's a fairly flat line. So as measured by um, circulating levels of estradiol and as measured by the wordless memory task, there wasn't much relationship between how much estrogen was actually present and how good the memory was. This, these data are based on women not using hormone therapy. Uh, since then, there have been several other studies that have looked at episodic memory during this midlife period of time. A study that was published just uh, this year from uh, Taiwan, a large study looking at women ages 40 to 54 uh, who are premenopausal. They were followed up a year and a half later. 114 women were now in the menopausal transition, and 381 remained premenopausal. They were given a fairly large neuropsychological battery. One of these tasks looked at um, episodic memory, that's this wordless delayed recall task. And as you can see here, NS refers to not significant. There was no statistical difference between the groups. And in most, not all, but most of the other measures that were looked at, in fact, there was no effect on episodic memory. Another study published this last year was uh, from Britain looking at a group of women all born in 1946. And again, on their episodic memory task, which is a wordless learning task, there was no difference uh, depending on which um, stage, re which reproductive stage these women were at age 53, so whether they were postmenopausal or premenopausal. So again, not really showing a strong effect um, in relationship to, uh, to memory. Now what about hormone therapy per se during midlife? As you'll hear in a few minutes, there are a lot of data looking at hormone therapy estrogens um, in older postmenopausal women, starting to be more in uh, younger women, but still not a lot. These are some earlier cross-sectional data that we collected from Melbourne looking at women um, who had never used hormone therapy, who had used hormone therapy in the past but had stopped and were currently using hormone therapy, looking at this uh, recall and that wordless task I mentioned before. As you can see here, the heights of the columns are similar. There were no significant effects based on hormone therapy usage. Those are cross-sectional data, looking at the same group of women followed up five years later, given the same memory task, um, looking at the total number of words that they can remember. Uh, it, in, it made no difference whether they weren't and never used hormone therapy at the time of initial testing, were past users or current users. You can see five years later the change in scores, five years present, five years ago present, and so forth, were the same across groups, and whether they'd stopped or started hormone therapy in their intervening time once that was taken into consideration didn't really change um, the results there. This is a complicated slide. You, most of the details here aren't very important. You'll see another one similar to this in a few minutes. But this slide summarizes the clinical trials that I'm aware of that have looked at hormone therapy among younger women, and here the cutoff was um, age 60. Um, clinical trials, or randomized controlled trials, are important because this is the best way to have unbiased information about what might really be going on. And you can see maybe about eight studies have been published. Um, they've used different kinds of estrogens. Again, these details aren't important. I would point out that the number of women studying these, these trials have been fairly small. Um, total numbers of women, 18, 26, and, and so forth and the total duration of the studies have been fairly small, six months, three months. Um, and the point I want to emphasize here, when episodic memory was looked at, although there's some variability, there's not a large signal 
that there's been dramatic improvement in, um, in memory for these fairly small short-term trials. Uh, some other cognitive domains are shown here. I want to uh, point your attention to studies done by Sherwin here in 1988 and Phillips and Sherwin in 1992 from McGill University. Uh, smaller studies, but two studies that showed specific improvement in verbal forms of episodic memory. These are studies that were done with women who were surgically menopausal. So their ovaries were taken out for medical conditions. They were immediately treated um, immediately after surgery with either placebo or fairly high doses of estrogen. And it turned out that in these studies um, conducted as clinical trials that there was an effect not across all cognitive domains, apparently more in verbal episodic memory, suggesting that perhaps in this subpopulation that there is a signal of, um, where estrogen would have an effect on memory. Next slide, which goes back to the question that was asked earlier, have you noticed changes in your memory over the past few years? This is in the Seattle study, 62% of women responded yes. And among the, the women who responded yes are asked, well, what kinds of memory problems have you had? And they listed a number of different things, um, as one might imagine. Difficulty recalling names, recalling words. That's a form of memory, but it's not the same as the kind of episodic memory that I was referring to before. In fact, um, this kind of memory, sometimes referred to as semantic memory, trouble with names, trouble remembering actors in movies. Um, you know, I, I do it all the time. Um, it's a form of memory that probably does change with aging, but doesn't have the same prognostic significance vis-a-vis -vis Alzheimer's disease that episodic memory does. So that's one form of memory. When someone says their memory is bad, it would, they can mean several things. If they mean this, it's not the same as meaning episodic memory. Some women uh, said difficulty with everyday behavior, like walking into a room and forgetting why you walk into the room. I'm sure no one here has done that. but. <laughs> You walk in there, you don't remember why, you retrace your steps, you go back again, oh, my keys, I need my keys. So that's what this refers to, difficulty concentrating, need for memory aids like lists or calendars, or forgetting events. The latter two do sound like episodic memory, but the point is when someone says memory is bad, they mean something's going on, but it may not be episodic memory, um, and so the the clinical significance may not be the same depending on what the actual complaint refers to. Um, also, this is interesting, these are data from a Dutch study, I've seen several other studies that have made the same point. Um, this is from Maastricht Ask, where people at different ages were asked, among other things, do you consider yourself as being forgetful? And you can see as a function of age, you had different responses. Um, but a substantial number of people did. So it wasn't something that only affects older people. All of us, or most of us, feel forgetful at uh, different times. Some of us feel forgetful much of the time. And there was no effect in this study um, of an, some variables. Age, of course, was very important. Uh, older age, more forgetfulness. Depression, subjective, poor health was uh, associated with a greater response to being forgetful. But interestingly, sex wasn't. So sometimes, um, Women forget that men also are forgetful and are even willing to admit it. Now the response rate here is a little bit lower in terms of being forgetful than in Seattle, but I just think the Dutch are more stoic than, um, than Americans. Or less insightful, who knows. Some of you here were, were perhaps here a month ago when Dr. Uh, Stefanik gave her wonderful overview of the Women's Health Initiative. Um, it's an, an extremely important study. It's had a lot of uh, implications for medical practice, and uh, she has been sort of one of the leaders in making sure that it's, it went forth and is still going forth. Um, very briefly, it was a large randomized trial. Women who are postmenopausal, ages 50 to 79, were eligible, and they were treated with either placebo or with an estrogen, the estrogen being a particular form, conjugated equine estrogens, and they got also a progestogen if they had a uterus or were given estrogen alone, if they didn't, if they were randomized to active treatment. And there are a number of different outcomes. Primary outcome initially was based on coronary heart disease with breast cancer being one of the other um, outcomes that were, was of particular interest. Other outcomes were also looked at. But in terms of what I want to talk about now is the uh, Women's Health Initiative Memory Study. I think uh, that was introduced in, in the, uh, my, my introduction. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer because memory actually wasn't measured directly, but it made a nice acronym. So this is a WIMS trial. 
And it was an ancillary study of the larger women's health initiative. Um, and it was looking at dementia as one of the outcomes. And it was restricted to women who were ages 65 to 79 at baseline. So they didn't have an episodic memory outcome as one of the direct measures, but there was a measure of global cognition. And um, what the study showed in the estrogen plus progestin arm, that looking at average scores followed over the course of the trial. Uh, women in the placebo group are shown here in green. Women who are randomized to active treatment here with the estrogen plus progestogen are shown in pink. You can see that there's a slight difference. It favored women in the placebo group. If you notice here in the scale for this particular task, the modified mini mental state examination, this is a 100-point scale. Most women started off around uh, 95 and a half points here, and the differences are fairly small. In fact, it's about a fifth of a point on reanalysis that just missed statistical significance, but clinically this difference isn't large enough on average to be very important. And in the other arm of the Women's Health Initiative memory study, looking at estrogen by itself, um, it's actually a different group of women, so average scores are a little bit lower. But you can see that the two track uh, similarly as well. And you can see here the difference was a quarter of a point and differences were statistically significant. The important point being, at least in terms of global cognition, certainly no benefit of active treatment with, with estrogen, not much difference in terms of clinical significance in, uh, with, um, and with respect to average score in this particular task. There have actually been a number of good studies now that have looked at um, more broadly based cognitive outcomes in older postmenopausal women looking at the effects of hormone therapy. And uh, this, the studies that I'm aware of are summarized here in this slide. Um, and again, the details are probably overwhelming, but let me point out several things. Um, first, different hormone prepar preparations were used, but the studies tended to be fairly large. Um, the HERS trial, for example, over 1,000 women. Uh, 461 women in the West trial, which was looking at women who had had a preceding stroke. Um, we'll come back to this one in a minute. More recently, a lower dose um, estradiol trial by Christine Yaffe at UCSF. And if you look at memory as the cognitive outcome, you can see fairly consistently these show no significant differences in terms of memory score. So these are studies conducted as randomized clinical trials. There are a number of studies now showing similar outcomes. The length of the studies have been uh, fairly long, nine months, four years. Uh, the shortest is, is uh, almost five months. So all of these trials are fairly long in duration. One of these, the WISCA trial shown here next to the bottom of the slide um, by Resnick et al. is actually an ancillary study of the WHI ancillary study. So WISCA is an ancillary study of WIMS. And this is a study where they did implement, investigators implemented a large cognitive battery that included episodic memory, included other domains. The battery itself was implemented three years after treatment randomization. And at the three-year mark when the test was given at the first time, there was no significant difference between groups with respect to the episodic memory score. They were retested a little over a year later. There was a small decline on a verbal episodic memory task, um, a non-significant improvement in a non-verbal episodic memory task, but essentially the magnitude of change is fairly small. And I think there's a fairly consistent message that there's certainly no benefit for episodic memory, probably no substantial effect when, it, when hormone therapy, when estrogens are initiated um, at an older age, after age 60 or age 65 or so forth. And, this, and, and these are data we didn't know, you know, we weren't aware of three or four or five years ago. I think the, the picture is much more settled now, at least at that, within that age group than it would have been previously. So let's move on uh, to Alzheimer's disease. Um, it's the most common cause of dementia, and recall that dementia refers to sort of severe memory or cognitive impairment enough to interfere substantially with daily activities. A very early uh, symptom most of the time is loss of episodic memory. That's why something like mild cognitive impairment becomes an important prognostic sign. It's a disorder who, of course, of old age, but its prevalence increases with age, uh, perhaps a doubling in rate every five years or so after age 65, at least up to about age 90. And it's a disorder that affects women one and a half to three times as often as men. There are a number of genetic factors and environmental factors that are thought to be important, um, etiologically important. And for dementia symptoms that begin early on, and early here is usually defined as before about age 60, 
There have been point mutations in several genes that have been determined to lead to Alzheimer's disease. For late onset illness, which is much more common, um, these early deterministic genes or mutations essentially have already shown up. There are some genetic factors, particularly um, a variation in apolipoprotein E that it associated with increased risk, but some people have the E4 allele, the, 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 the variant that's associated with increased risk and don't develop Alzheimer's disease. Some people without the E4 allele do, so it's not deterministic in the same sense that some of the point mutations are for early onset Alzheimer's disease. This is sort of a textbook slide showing the typical pathology of Alzheimer's disease. This is a silver stain looking at the brain. These little uh, structures here are nerve cells and neurons. And the dark staining uh, area within these nerve cells are the nerve fibrillary tangles. Um, certain neurons in certain parts of the brain are a predilection for developing nerve fibrillary tangles. The other abnormality in this slide are these structures shown here, a uh, smaller one here. These are the so-called plaques, the neuritic plaques, widely distended abnormal ner neurites, nerve processes with different stains you would see deposit in the center um, beta amyloid, which is an abnormal uh, protein breakdown product which is associated with Alzheimer's disease. One of the reasons why Alzheimer's disease is much more a disease of women compared to men is sort of, well, it's sort of bad news for men. We aren't around long enough to be at highest risk. This is, these are data just from the U.S. Census Bureau showing the number of men left alive per 100 women as a function of age. So we're okay at age 50, um, somewhere in the high 90s, but you can see by the time uh, we're looking at 85 plus, maybe 40 men per 100 women. And since the incidence and prevalence of Alzheimer's disease, it's much higher down at this end of the age spectrum, a lot more women are going to have Alzheimer's disease just by virtue of the fact that they're stronger than men. They live longer than men. Um, that's probably not the whole picture. In looking at the actual incidence that takes this kind of difference into consideration, some studies do show uh, a gender difference such that women are at higher risk compared to men. Not all studies show that. One of the studies that does seem to show that are actually a series of four studies from Europe uh, combined as a Eurodim um, analysis shown here. Looking at the cumulative risk of developing Alzheimer's disease as a function of age, assuming the absence of dementia at age 65, you can see men and women are shown separately here in this graph. Very low risk, you know, up until um, older age. But you can see over time, at least in the European study, there does appear to be an increase in risk. Looking at relative risk, um, women here had a relative risk of 1.5 compared to men, um, as shown there. And one way of looking at this um, differently would be, for example, at age 85, if you sort of project upwards and then go back over to the left-hand side of the axis, you can see here, at least in the European study, maybe twice as much Alzheimer's disease for women compared to men. So some of the studies do suggest, although a lot of the, the difference between men and women is, is due to the fact that there are simply more older women than, than men, um, perhaps not all the difference is explained that way. Now in terms of hormones, in terms of estrogen and Alzheimer's disease, there was a very strong biological rationale why a treatment for uh, women who already had Alzheimer's disease would be a good idea. I haven't gone through some of the biological rationale, but included uh, important effects on transmitters like uh, acetylcholine, effects on the deposition of beta amyloid within the brain itself. Estrogen reduces deposition of beta amyloid. It um, is protective of the cholinergic neurons, at least in animal models. And there were other lines of evidence that suggested that this would be a good treatment. Um, there are a number of observational studies and uncontrolled trials that suggested a beneficial effect. And now at least a half a dozen or so clinical trials that have been done um, in a more controlled fashion. And these trials are, are summarized here on this slide. And you can see some of the slides seem to suggest an, an overall treatment benefit, at least according to the way they were reported by authors. Although if you actually break that down and look at the, the actual outcomes, um, some of the, the beneficial studies aren't as cl clear cut as maybe the, the, the summary abstract would at first appear. Um, there have been other studies that have suggested no substantial effect on different kinds of outcomes, including a smaller study that we did when I was at the University of Southern California, shown here, and some somewhat larger studies done here. In general, the studies that show no effect um, are somewhat larger. They were conducted at longer periods of time, 12 months being the longest. 
Um, they tended to use more standardized outcome measures. And I think the general consensus is it's, uh, that estrogen as a form of treatment for Alzheimer's disease was a good idea that turned out once studies were done not to really have a, a big signal here. Um, a probably more important issue for most people is what would the effects of a hormone like estrogen be in terms of preventing Alzheimer's disease or more generally preventing dementia. Um, the only clinical trial that's addressed this is the Women's Health Initiative Memory Study where the defined primary outcome is looking at the risk of developing dementia. And here this, the results suggest that, that uh, hormone therapy actually did not decrease the risk of developing dementia, it actually increased risk. And those data are shown here. Um, the two groups, placebo group or the active treatment with hormone therapy group are shown in different colors. And this is a slide that looks at cumulative risk over a period of time. So the higher the graph goes, then the more people have developed um, a dementia diagnosis. And you can see here that the placebo group is doing better than the active treatment group. And if you look at this in terms of a relative risk, um, I know these numbers probably don't mean a lot to you, but 1.76 indicates that the risk is 76% 76 higher for the active treatment group compared to placebo looking at this overall difference. And these numbers break it down to trial for the estrogen alone trial. The relative risk was about 49% higher here, about 105% higher. This was statistically significant. This not quite. The combined analysis was statistically significant. So here in the Women's Health Initiative, the only clinical trial that's looked at dementia risk in, in the context of a clinical trial showed increased risk. And this result was somewhat surprising to a number of people because a fairly large body of observational literature suggested that the risk would be in the other direction. That's why this is one of the, it wasn't why the original trial was planned, but why the ancillary study was planned to look at this outcome. What this slide summarizes are observational studies that looked at the association between a woman using hormone therapy after menopause and the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. And the way this is set up is that these little boxes or triangles represent point estimates of risk. And when the risk is less than one, it suggests that the association is protective. That means it appeared to be a good thing. And when it's greater than one, then it was in the other direction. These horizontal black lines represent confidence intervals. And when the entire black line is on one side of this dotted line, on one side of one, then those results were statistically significant. And just looking at this, you can see that most studies suggested a protective association, and most of these were statistically significant. Uh, not all, but, but most were. In fact, several meta-analyses that combine the information from all the studies came up with that conclusion. And this includes three studies that I've been involved with uh, from the Alzheimer's Center at the University of Southern California, shown here, uh, with Ann Leah Paganini Hill at the Leisure World Retirement Community in Southern California here and more recently with the multi-institutional research in Alzheimer's genetic epidemiology organized um, through Boston University, um, shown here. And these are studies, among others, that suggested protective associations. So the question is, what's going on? What's different about the observational studies compared to the clinical trials? And some of those differences are obvious, and we'll get to that in a minute. One point, though, in stepping back a little bit is to realize women in the observational studies weren't randomized or allocated to receive estrogen at particular times. They took it depending on when they went to the doctors and what symptoms were or, or what doctors and patients thought. And based on findings from a national survey, this, these, this is the NHANES 3 study, looking at women who used hormone therapy and asking when they initiated it. In fact, most women who did use hormone therapy initiated at a fairly early time, 41% actually before the final menstrual period when they're having some vasomotor symptoms but had, were still menstruating, another 44% within one year of menopause, and a much smaller proportion uh, going out beyond that. So one of the differences in observational studies is that most women were using hormone therapy at a fairly early age. If you look at the data from the same study in terms of duration, about five years use was sort of a median use here. So most women were using it for a finite period of time at a relatively younger age. Among the case control studies that were shown, or the, uh, the observational studies shown in the previous slide, one of these is the Marsh study uh, organized by Lindsay Ferrer at Boston University. And one of the outcomes, like some of the other studies, is that looking at the use of hormone therapy compared to no hormone therapy use, and looking at the risk, the relative risk is 
3.7, meaning 30% uh, risk reduction among hormone therapy users. But there was a significant interaction based on age. And then when the age groups are broken down into age tertiles and um, three groups of women were compared, it turned out that the risk, risk reduction appeared only among women in the youngest age group here, not among women in the older age groups. You, here you can see the risk reduction compared to the comparison group shown here. And among uh, a number of different possible interpretations, one of the interpretations could be that uh, use of hormone therapy by younger women, perhaps closer to the age of menopause, might be protective and used later on may not be. One of the interpretations. One of the other studies, observational studies, was from Cache County, Utah by John Breitner and colleagues. Um, looking at never users versus ever users of hormone therapy, about a 40% risk reduction shown here. And when this group is broken down to past users and current users, you can see that current users of hormone therapy showed absolutely no risk reduction. It looked like the association that seemed to be protective is more among past users. So in trying to consider why a lot of observational studies suggested a protective association. The Women's Health Initiative Memory Study indicated a, uh, just, just the opposite, a detrimental effect of estrogens. There are a number of considerations, and the most important has to do with susceptibility to bias, shown here. So the reason why one does randomize clinical trials is because a number of different biases are really um, don't come into effect because of the randomization procedure, because of the blinding. And in observational studies, no matter how well done, no matter how uh, well-intentioned the investigators are, there's always a possibility for bias. Some studies, a lot of possibility for bias, uh, particularly what's called uh, sometimes a healthy user bias, and that is the women in general who use hormone therapies have better access to health care, were better educated to start with, and perhaps it was some of these other factors associated with hormone therapy usage and not the hormone therapy itself that led to the protective association in a number of the observational studies. One of the other points to indicate here is that there is also a difference in two other factors. The timing of hormone therapy usage and closely related to that, the age at which hormone therapy usage occur. In the WIMS clinical trials, um, hormone therapy uh, usage was um, more remote from the time of menopause because these women had to be at least age 65 to be eligible for enrollment in the trial. And of course, uh, these were older women. For the observational studies, women of all ages were included in some of the studies, but on average, uh, hormone therapy was initiated closer to menopause and was used primarily by younger women. So the two competing explanations now, one which seems more powerful, and that is that the, the observational studies were just um, biased. The other is that there were other differences that um, differ between the clinical trial with WIMS and the observational studies that leads to sort of a lot of current interest about trying to sort out what's going on. Now, is there any sort of um, how much weight should be given to this early usage difference? And the answer is, isn't clear. Some of the post-hoc analyses we did seem to support that it's worth looking at more closely, but these um, aren't convincing, I, I don't think. One of the studies that seems a little bit more Intriguing, at least, is a, a post hoc or follow up analysis done by a Scandinavian group um, by Bagger et al., published a year ago, looking at women who were originally enrolled in clinical trials of hormone therapy or placebo for osteoporosis. Um, they were treated at a mean age of 54 years for a couple of years, and then they were followed up um, sometime later, five to 15 years later, mean of 11 years and they were given a cognitive measure. Now, this isn't a great measure. This is the orientation memory concentration test, a fairly easy task, sometimes used to screen for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in fact, there were really no mean differences. But looking at women who had scores, error scores above a certain cutoff, there were actually more women in the placebo group compared to women in the original hormone therapy group who um, had these high error scores. We express this as a relative risk of being cognitively impaired, defined by the score. The relative risk is 33%. That's actually a, a fairly large difference. Now, it's not clear that this really means there'd be a difference in terms of something like Alzheimer's disease. A lot of women weren't available for being contacted, but the original estrogen usage in these trials was uh, a randomized usage rather than um, being more determined by access to healthcare. And so it, it, I think it's enough it's, it's these kinds of data that keep the question alive and make investigators want to sort of 
try to see what's really going on. There are a couple studies that are looking at some of this. Um, sometimes the term uh, critical window is used, the hypothesis being that estrogen is used during a certain window of time by younger women when receptors still haven't been downregulated, perhaps, or when atherosclerosis has an effect of the vasculature, so the estrogen effects will be different. Um, there are several studies that have an opportunity to look at that. One of these is referred to as the KEEP study, the Kronos Early Estrogen Prevention Study that's been organized by uh, Mitch Harmon and colleagues. And it's a group, it's a randomized clinical trial, over 700 women. Um, recruitment is ongoing, several different estrogen uh, combinations. The primary outcome has to do with atherosclerosis in the carotid artery, but there's a fairly nice cognitive battery that will be looked at. And at least in terms of broad cognitive outcomes, this is one of the studies that will have a chance to look at that. And another study that I have some involvement with is the ELITE trial that's been organized by Howard Hodes at the University of Southern California, early versus late intervention trial with estrogen. And those of you that aren't sort of clinical, clinical trial sophisticators sort of maybe realizing that you have to come up with an acronym or no one will ever remember what study you're doing. And industry-supported trials are particularly good with coming up with particularly good acronyms. So if it's an awkward acronym, it's probably coming out of a university. Anyway, the elite trial of uh, 504 women, and this, this is NIH funded, uh, with an early group and a late group in terms of timing of menopause, looking at a particular estrogen preparation, and also looking at carotid atherosclerosis as a primary outcome, but a fairly broadly based cognitive battery as a secondary outcome. These are actually fairly small studies for the kinds of outcomes they're looking at with respect to cognitive measures, you know, the 700 women or, or 500 women, but they're larger than other studies that have been done or likely to be done in the current climate, and so at least maybe we'll have a better hint about what the real story is in several years' time. So the conclusions from what I've said so far is that in terms of natural menopause, natural menopause per se probably does not have a substantial effect on memory. Um, this is based on observational evidence, but in fact observational evidence is the best we're ever going to have. You can't randomize menopause. You can't say, all right, this group is not going to be menopausal and this group is. So the information we'll have in that is always going to be observational and it will depend on the quality of the observational evidence that we have. What's available now is better than what's before and it appears that natural menopause, at least over a period of several years and within the relatively short term, doesn't appear to have a substantial effect on memory. Hormone therapy used around the time of natural menopause over the short term probably doesn't have a large effect in memory. There's some clinical trial evidence to support this, but it's still fairly limited, so I think this is still somewhat more of an, uh, an open question. Estrogen use after surgical menopause may have an effect on some cognitive domains like verbal episodic memory. I mentioned a couple studies by uh, Barbara Sherwin at McGill University in support of this. And surprisingly, we don't have larger studies to, to back that up. But based on what we have, I think that's still um, sort of a reasonable conclusion for now. Hormone therapy use um, in some period later after menopause does not have a substantial effect on memory. Uh, these were older postmenopausal women. And as I said before, a, a fairly substantial body of clinical trial evidence now in support of that. Um, we have clinical trial evidence that hormone therapy does not improve symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, and that hormone therapy used in women without dementia later after menopause, this is from the Women's Health Initiative Memory Study, actually increases the risk of dementia. And with respect to effects of hormone therapy on remote outcomes like Alzheimer's disease, when used for several years around the time of menopause, we really don't have a clear answer now. The observational evidence implies that maybe the association would be protective, but as I said before, observational findings could be biased, and the Women's Health Initiative uh, Memory Study, which gave us important answers, really didn't include women this young. It wasn't intended to, and so we can't really use that information for this younger age group, so it's an area of further investigation. Um, other things that are coming up in the future, there are compounds that have estrogenic effects but aren't really estrogens. Uh, one class is referred to as selective estrogen receptor modulators. One of these, which is on the market, is raloxifen, which is marketed for osteoporosis prevention. And one of the secondary studies um, in the large trials looking at osteoporosis had to do with dementia outcome. I was involved in dementia adjudication for the study. And in the Moore study, um, after three years of treatment, over 5,000 women, 
uh, were screened for cognitive impairment. Those that didn't pass screening were referred for additional evaluation. Uh, 700 women completed evaluation. And with the final adjudication, looking at just the higher dose of raloxifen, there was no effect of lower dose compared to placebo, looking at mild cognitive impairment defined a little bit differently than what we've talked about. Um, the higher dose raloxifen group actually had a statistically significant reduction in developing cognitive impairment. If you look at dementia due to Alzheimer's disease, there was also a risk reduction. The numbers are fairly small and it didn't reach statistical significance. Looking at all causes of dementia or mild cognitive impairment, sort of borderline significance shown here, but at least a suggestion that a compound that has some estrogenic effects in some tissues, but also non-estrogenic effects or even anti-estrogenic effects in other tissues might have a role in some aspects of cognition. We don't know, but we've actually organized a small clinical trial to start to pilot this in women with Alzheimer's disease, and this is sort of up and getting underway now with uh, sites involving Kaiser Permanente here in Northern California and Indiana University. Now I get spammed all the time with similar kinds of things, but this is actually an old snail mail kind of spam I received even before I reached the AARP official age of 50. Um, it makes a good slide. <laughs> so people have asked about testosterone in terms of cognitive aging for men in terms of Alzheimer's disease prevention. And in fact, there's some reason to be interested in this topic other than slides like this. Um, the brain has receptors not only for estrogen, but also for androgens, um, also for other kinds of steroid hormones. Um, there are some data, not overwhelming data yet, that suggests that um, testosterone might have effect on visual spatial functions, certain kinds of cognitive domains, and there's some um, observational evidence that suggests that testosterone levels might be lower in men who go on to develop Alzheimer's disease compared to men who don't. This, I mean, to me, in a general sense of field with testosterone with respect to cognitive aging and, and Alzheimer's disease, looks a lot like the estrogen field did five or 10 years ago. Intriguing information, enough information to want to look more closely and find out answers, but not enough to be very certain about yet. Um, there are a lot of different factors that have been associated with cognitive aging, with, with dementia. Um, I give a, a whole talk and something like this occasionally, and each time I go to update my slides, the font gets smaller and smaller. In fact, you know, I could add two or three times more on this slide than is indicated here. I also keep changing my happy faces because as more studies are done, some are contradictory, and whether it's a smiley face or a sad face sort of depends on what's what latest study has come out. But basically, when one looks at factors that have been associated with not doing as well with cognitive aging or with Alzheimer's disease, obviously, if you could stay young forever, you would avoid a lot of this. If your parents treated you well and you got good genes, you're better off than if you got the wrong genes. There's something referred to as cerebral reserve, which I'll come back to in a minute. A fair amount of exercise, including both human data and animal data, suggesting the physical exercise might be protective against cognitive aging, might be protective against Alzheimer's disease. It's certainly good for cognitive aging in rats. Um, depression, not so good. Prior head, head injury, not so good. A lot of cardiovascular risk factors appear to be associated with um, cognitive change with aging and also with Alzheimer's disease risk. Cardiovascular factors like hypertension, um, high cholesterol, homocysteine, uh, smoking, these are all associated with higher risk of Alzheimer's disease and some of these with poor cognitive outcomes. Um, statins, there's a clinical trial going on now to see the effects of statins with respect to cognitive aging, for example. A uh, recent study suggested that some of the omega-3 uh, fatty acids found in fish, for example, might reduce the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. We've talked a bit about estrogen and testosterone. Um, Again, the direction of the smiles is a little bit arbitrary. Social drinking has been associated in some studies with um, better cognitive functioning, um, reduced risk of Alzheimer's disease. Anti-inflammatory agents have pros and cons in support and maybe not in support. Antioxidants, um, depending on studies, but blueberries, chocolate, um, often thought to be good things. And so one might think that a good happy meal would be a meal that includes fish, um, omega-3, polyunsaturated fatty acids, wine, red wine, and some of the initial studies looking at the association with red wine and Alzheimer's disease actually came from the Bordeaux region of France, where the, 
where the only alcohol that was available was red wine. <laughs> so people have looked closely at red wine, has flavonoids, flavonoids are antioxidants, or also have some estrogenic effects, and people can sort of build a nice biological model. But some of the studies show similar association with other forms of alcohol. And the question is, is moderate drinking actually good, or is this another healthy user effect? People that drink in moderation are the same people that play tennis on weekends and go to their doctors and do other health-promoting activities, and maybe this is just an association. We don't know. Um, in terms of cerebral reserve, this refers to the fact that maybe having more brain reserve reduces the risk of cognitive impairment with aging or developing dementia. And there's a fair amount of observational evidence in support of this. Surprisingly, big heads are sometimes a good thing. Um, animals reared in enriched environments, um, um, developing sort of richer connections between nerve cells, appear to, um, to function better on memory kinds of tasks when they're older. Uh, a very popular hypothesis for people like me who have who has spent his entire life in an academic setting, so over, being overly educated um, is a very popular hypothesis. Maybe it's actually good for us instead of removing us from the real world. Occupations that require a mental activity. Uh, people that use their, their brains in, in uh, leisure activities, playing games, uh, crossword puzzles, so forth. Some evidence that suggests that that's going to be protective. Social support systems, um, mental activities. These are all things that are associated uh, with um, in different studies with reduced risk of cognitive impairment, of reducing Alzheimer's disease. And one of the interests that we have here is in physical and mental activity. And there's a pilot um, project that Dr. Stefanik, uh, Dr. Abby King, myself have, uh, are working with in collaboration with a group at Wake Forest University. The Wake Forest group actually has a lead referred to as a SHARP pilot. And this is one of these acronyms where I don't think the words actually fit, and I'm not sure I can remember it. But it's something like, Senior Health Activity Research Project um, pilot, but it involves both mental activity as one of the arms, physical activity. Um, it's being proposed as a pilot. It's under review for funding. It may or may not get funded, but the hope is we'll see a signal there, be able to go back in and consider a larger multicenter trial looking at both physical and mental um, activities as interventions for cognitive aging. Um, the Alzheimer's Association, a wonderful organization, by the way, with national uh, offices that have a lot of family-oriented information as well, supporting research, local chapters um, that provide wonderful information for families. Alzheimer's Association is sort of picked up in this, and the Maintain Your Brain workbook, although the print is a little bit small, one of the parts is to engage your brain. If you read down here, it's try to, I can't even read it, make a new recipe, for example. And one of those is <laughs> attend a workshop or class. <laughs> I figured this counts, all of you are okay. It doesn't even say you have to be awake. So finally, let me conclude with this. Um, this is a weather map, and this is the coastal outline of the U.S. This little bitty green uh, spot here, I think, is the Mississippi Delta. New Orleans sits right above here. And the strategies we have now for trying to take care of people who have dementia, who have Alzheimer's disease, I think is a bit like FEMA coming in after Hurricane Katrina is hit. It's not always efficient, it's, it's expensive, it probably makes some difference, but it's not really the best bang for the buck. Um, this is Hurricane Katrina poised to make landfall here. This is um, mild cognitive impairment, I think. It's sort of a good chance to make an intervention, the chance where interventions will make a difference, but where you really would make a bigger difference is trying to sort of um, have some effect before the hurricane is developed. And I think uh, where a lot of the research is going is try to come up with strategies or interventions or try to determine risk factors that are present um, at earlier periods in our life, when we first hit middle age, rather than waiting until when we're sort of at the mild cognitive impairment stage. Mm -hmm.